Good morning, my name is Luca Pipia and I work at the Cartographic and Geological Institute of Catalonia in Barcelona, Spain. My talk today is titled Multispectral and Hyperspectral Sensors, Principles, Technologies and Sensors. So this is me, my, my work deals with a multispectral and hyperspectral sensor radiometric modeling. Uh, basically I'm involved in the radiometric accuracy assessment of the multispectral and hyperspectral sensor operated regularly by the ICGC. Besides, my research area deals, uh, deals also with the extraction of useful information based on physical modeling of the acquired measurements. The purpose of this talk is to provide a general overview of multispectral and hyperspectral sensor world. As you can easily understand, this is an extremely wide area of research and providing an exhaustive overview of this field is unfeasible in the short time we have at disposal. Then the main purpose becomes to make you understand what information is remotely sensed by this type of sensors, both in terms of radiation they receive and what part of the electromagnetic spectrum they must be sensitive to, depending on the study you want to perform. Here the outline of the presentation, a brief introduction to the problem, the principles of passive remote sensing ima imaging and the technology used to convert the incoming radiation information into images. In the last slides, I'll give you some information about the most important multispectral and hyperspectral sensors nowadays available in the scientific community, both airborne and spaceport sensors. And finally, an overview of the future hyperspectral satellite missions. So first of, all, first of all, it's important to recall the basic scheme of any remote sensing model. In order to extract useful information from a measurement, we need to have clear in mind what the information content of the target we want to observe. Then we must be sure that this piece of information is really arriving at the sensor. If just this information is arriving, or if, or if additional spurious contributions are present too. Afterwards, being the sensor sensitive to what we are interested in, we need to know what is the sensor real output. In case this output is directly the quantity we are interested in, then bingo. But this is quite unreal. In the real world, there are always additional undesired terms, first of all the noise. This means that we need to make it clear how to exploit this output source of data to achieve our goal. Concerning the multispectral and hyperspectral sensors, they deal with electromagnetic spectral information with wavelength between the 0.4 microns and 14 microns. They are essentially passive devices that converts, the, converts uh, this radiation into digital information and finally into an image. Essentially, we can say that this sensor carry out a sampling of the radiation intensity coming from a, an observed target, being either an, an object or a surface. As we will see throughout this tutorial, the wavelength at which they perform the sampling, as well as the bandwidth of the spectrum they select, depend on the material chosen for the device, on the technology of the device, and on the data processing itself. So let's start with the physical principles. The main source of energy that multispectral and hyperspectral remote sensor image is the sun. Yet it might be the moon or other artificial or natural sources. But in general, the energy to be imaged is carried by electromagnetic waves and arrive and it arrives more or less directly to the detectors. So first, let's start with some definition to introduce the physical quantity the sensors are sensitive to and what we are interested in. First of all, the radiant energy Q, which is the energy carried by a traveling electromagnetic wave from a source to the detector and is measured in joules. The radiant flux phi is the amount of energy carried during a time unit, basically a power, and is measured in volts. This power, expressed per unit area, is usually referred to as radiance em uh, radiant emittance or irradiance. In general, emittance is used to describe power emitted by surface. Irradiance describes the, the radiant energy impinging a surface. The term radiant intensity is used to define the radiant flux per solid angle unit. The radiant intensity is normalized to the observation area, which is a projection, the projection of the surface on the plane normal to the observation direction. In this case, we speak of radiance. And finally, we have the spectral radiance, which is a radiance at a specific wavelength, or we can say also normalized to wavelength. 
What multispectral sensor as well as hyperspectral sensor measure is always radiant energy. During radiometric calibration this information is converted into radiance by taking into account the observation time and the geometrical properties of the sensor. For, for hyperspectral sensors the narrow band approximation is assumed to carry out a normalization with respect to the channel bandwidth, finally obtaining the spectral radiance. So, summarizing the main concept, we can say that passive sensors mainly rely on natural sources of electromagnetic radiation, as the sun or the moon. In the plot here, you can observe in blue the profile of the average solar radiation, which spreads over the 0.4 to 3 micron window. The line in red defines the distribution of the so-called thermal radiation going from 3 microns up to 14 microns. Generally longer wavelength contributions are considered negligible. The plot here helps us introduce the basic division of the electromagnetic spectrum. Wavelengths from 0.4 up to 0.7 microns are referred to as visible domain. From 0.7 up to approximately 1.1 microns, there is the so-called near-infrared domain. Then we'll find the short wave infrared, the middle wave infrared, and finally the thermal infrared, going from 5 up to 14 microns. It's important to note that solar radiation contains direct contributions in the visible near and sphere domains, but not in the mirror or tier domains. What happens is that illuminating energy at, at shorter wavelengths is partially absorbed by surface and remitted at longer wavelengths according to the specific spectral properties of the surface. So there are two main parameters characterizing an object in the so-called visible and infrared domain. The first one is the reflectivity, which describes the amount of incoming radiation illuminating an object at a specific wavelength that is reflected off the object. This is used mainly to describe the surface properties in the visible near and short wave infrared. Then we have the spectral emissivity, which is used in the thermal infrared, and describes the amount of incoming radiation illuminating the object at a specific wavelength that is absorbed and, contribute, and contributes to the, to the thermal state of the object. In this animation here you can observe that sunlight streams through the atmosphere towards the surface of the Earth. A portion of the sunlight is reflected by clouds, other, uh, other, um, another part arrives um, attenuated to the surface, where it is reflected off proportionally to the surface, re surface reflectivity, and hits back through the atmosphere towards space. The remainder energy is absorbed by the surface of the Earth, warming it. On the right side of the animation, you can observe what happens at longer wavelengths. The warmed Earth emits long-wave radiation towards the atmosphere. Thermal radiation at 7 microns or 10 microns or 15 microns, microns interacts with the atmosphere. The 10 micron portion passes through the atmosphere with little loss. The 7 micron portion gets absorbed primarily by H2O and the 15 micron portion gets absorbed primarily by CO2 and H2O. This behavior becomes clearer in the picture on the right side of the slide. The atmospheric total absorbance is a function of, of the wavelength. It's important to observe that there are atmospheric windows where electromagnetic waves are less attenuated. These regions are often referred to as atmosphere windows and are used for remote sensing monitoring activities. The amount of absorption depends on the thickness of, of the atmosphere layer of the atmosphere layer that is considered, or in other terms, on the height of the platform carrying the sensor, being it a plane or a satellite. Then it becomes clear that if you want to retrieve useful information about the surface, you like to minimize atmospheric contributions, and hence you will select specific wavelength ranges where atmosphere is more transparent. On the contrary, if your goal is to estimate, for example, methane concentration, you will select the range around the methane absorption peak. At this point, it's important also to add some new keywords using multispectral and hyperspectral remote sensing. The spectral reflect reflectance, which is a function of the wavelength, and is the ratio between the spectral irradiance reflected off a material to the spectral irradiance incident on the material. The spectral transmittance, mainly used for the atmosphere, 
which is the ratio between the spectral irradiance transmitted through a material to the spectral irradiance incident on the material. And finally, we have the spectral absorbance, which is the ratio between the spectral irradiance absorbed in the material to the spectral irradiance incident on the material. More su most surfaces are opaque, which means that their transmittance is zero at any wavelength. In this case, at the thermal equilibrium, that is when the object is absorbing and remitting the same amount of energy per time unit, the absorption of the material is called emissivity. The emissivity is also described as the ratio between the emission of a material at the temperature T at the specific wavelength and the reference material called black body at the same temperature, which is basically able to emit uh, all the energy absorbed at a specific um, wavelength. We will see more in detail this concept in next slide. In order to provide an example of the amount of information carried by the reflectivity and emissivity profile, let's analyze briefly the reflectivity function of different types of vegetation, such as grass or conifers, in the visible near and the sphere spectrum. The reflectivity plot of a, co of a specific cover, in this case plants, is often referred to as spectral signature. The reason is that the plots emphasize specific properties of each type of plant that make it possible to distinguish it from others. Besides, it's possible to give, us, to give a physical interpretation to common features that all these curves show at specific wavelengths. In general, the, vi the visible spectral region is characterized by low reflectance and low transmittance due to the strong absorption of foliar pigments. The response at shorter lambda depends on the content of the different chlorophylls. The gradient you can observe around the 700 nanometers or 0.7 uh, micrometers is called the red edge and is related to the vegetation health. Another index often used to quantify the vegetation greenness is the so-called normalized differential vegetation index or NDVI, which compares the value of reflectivity before and after the red edge. In this short wave infrared, spectral characteristics are dominated by strong liquid water absorption and are influenced by the foliar content, contents such as cellulose, which is a major component of leaf cell walls, and lignin. But if vegetation response is so rich at the visible near infrared and short wave intra infrared, it becomes more flat in the median infrared and in the thermal infrared. For this reason, the ve for vegetation studies, these later two regions of spectral spectrum are not recommended. On the contrary, the medium infrared and, above all, the thermal infrared are particularly suitable for mineral and rock discrimination. We have already said that this region of the electromagnetic spectrum is usually described by the emissivity parameter. This quantity, always lying between 0 and 1, modulates the radiation of a real object with respect to a reference body called the black body. In general, a black body is intended as an ideal object in thermodynamic equilibrium at temperature T which is able to remit the whole amount of energy absorbed at all, at all uh, wavelengths. This amount of radiation is ruled by the so-called Planck laws, Planck law, Planck's law, and, and you can see in the left part of the slide, you can observe the, the, equation, the law equation, and the corresponding plots for the parameter T, varying between 0 and 100 uh, Celsius degree. On the right part of the slide, you can instead observe the spectral radiance of three different minerals at the same temperature, T equal to 300, 300 Kelvin. The black line represents the radiation of a black body at the same temperature, T equal, we have said, to 300 Kelvin. Emissivity is extremely useful not, not only to discriminate different objects, but also to identify differences in the texture. This is shown by the emissivity plots in the right bottom part of the slide, the plots correspond to coarse, fine, and medium-sized grains of the same silicate. So, summarizing, information about the reflectivity of covers as well as emissivity or temperature help us identify materials and detect specific biophysical properties we are interested in. This is the information arriving in the sensor that we want to estimate. But it, is this estimation so easy? The answer is no because the spectral radiance information arrives at the sensor along with other undesired contributions. Then, we need to estimate these spurious components in order to filter them out properly. 
We are not going to enter into the description of techniques for reflectivity retrieval or for emissivity and temperature separation. The purpose of this slides is just good to give you a feeling of what you need to take into account when it comes to interpret correctly the output of multispectral and hyperspectral sensors. To do this, we need to separate the visible near and sphere uh, domains from the mirror tier domains. <coughs> In the visible, uh, infra invisible and near infrared, and in the short wave infrared case, there are mainly five energy contributions summing up at the sensor. The first one is the direct solar radiation. This is the radiation coming from the sun to the top of the atmosphere, which travels through the atmospheric attenuating its intensity until it impedes the surface. At this point, it is reflected off of the surface according to the surface reflectivity signature and travels up towards the sensor. This term corresponds to number one. At this point, there are other four additional terms that must be taken into account. Three of, three of them are called indirect, indirect downwelling um, terms. The radiation from the sun is partially scattered by the atmosphere and the scattered component reflects on the surface and goes up to the sensor. This is number two. There is the fraction of incoming radiation that reflects on the surrounding objects towards the surface to be characterized and travels up to the sensor. And this is number three. And finally, there is the radiation term coming from the sun that reflects on, on pixels surrounding the one we want to characterize and goes up through, um, through the atmosphere. Here, this component is scattered by the atmosphere in all directions and the fraction hits down again to the surface. It's reflected on the pixel under study and finally goes up to the sensor. And this is number four. The last component, called upwelling path of radiance, is the sun radiation scattered by the atmosphere that arrives directly to the sensor without interacting with the surface. It's easy to understand that the equation modeling all these mechanisms must be handled very carefully in order to achieve an accurate estimation of the surface reflectivity. Concerning the long wave infrared, infrared radiation, there are uh, similar components. Yet the main difference is that solar radiation does not appear directly, but indirectly. This is because we have already seen that solar radiation contains wavelength only from the visible near to the short wave infrared. Nevertheless, the problem is not easier. The atmosphere scatters partially the solar radiation, but a fraction is absorbed, contributing to increase the air temperature. At this point, the air, as any matter at a temperature higher than zero Kelvin, starts emitting a longer wavelength. This means that a reliable description of the atmospheric emission is obtained using atmosphere simulators, such as Motran or 6S, for example, if its vertical structure is known. As a matter of fact, radio sending Radio sendings uh, simultaneous to data capture are usually employed to characterize the, atmosphere, uh, the atmospheric contributions. And finally, it's important to remember here um, an intrinsic indetermination that characterizes the thermal infrared radiation. Emissivity and absolute temperature couples in the equation describing the thermal infrared radiative model. The main consequence is that being n, the number of measurements at disposal, there will always be n, pl uh, n plus 1 unknowns. In order to separate temperature and emissivity then, it's, impor it's, it's important to use iterative techniques that have been developed for this, for this purpose. The accuracy of these techniques is usually related to the number of different wavelengths measured by the sensor. This number corresponds to the number of samples of the spectral radiance function that one has, have, one has a, disp a disposal. Mm, again, there is no room now for the description of the techniques to compensate for atmosphere or to separate emissivity from temperature. But what is important is that now you are aware of the, of the whole information that, that enters the sensor and what you need to take into account if you want to retrieve only that part of radiation you are really interested in. Okay, so now we know what kind of information enters the sensor. Let's now start with the description of the sensor used to describe this radiation. 
In general, a multispectral sensor is a device able to measure electromagnetic radiation in more than three uh, different bands. Conventional multispectral sensors co um, collect radiation over a broad spectral range. The reason is that this way the amount of energy that enters the sensor is high enough to provide high signal-to-noise ratios. This means that high-quality data from the radiometric point of view can be collected. The image on the left part, in the left part of the slide corresponds to the DMC sensor. This is a photogrammetric camera used for airborne cartographic acquisitions. For example, this is the typical sensor used to generate the Google Earth image at centimeter, centimeter uh, spa, um, spatial resolution. The sensor acquires spectral radiation information using five different broad filters. The blue, the green, the red, the near-infrared, and the, and the panchromatic filters. You can observe in the photo in the middle that each channel is measure, measured using an independent optics. Usually, the multispectral have channels at the lower, um, multispectral channels um, have a lower re spatial resolution than the panchromatic channels, and the higher resolution of the final multispectral image is obtained applying pan sharpening techniques. With respect to normal photos, the near infrared channel gives the opportunity to play with channels for vegetation studies or classification. After the, the radiometric calibration of data, converting the radiant energy into radiance, and the spatial co-registration of all the channels, this is what we can of observe if we combine, for example, as an RGB image, the real red, green and blue channels, and this is you can observe in the left part, in the image on the left, or if we substitute the red color, the red channel for the near infrared channel. The stronger response of vegetation in this channel makes it po its detection much easier with respect to the surrounding man-made object. If we, we move from urban to satellite platforms, it's mandatory to mention the first example of multispectral satellite mission for Earth observation, the Landsat. Actually, the Landsat program is the longest running enterprise for acquisition of satellite imagery of the Earth. It started in 1972 with Landsat 1, operated by NASA. Landsat 1 was equipped with a four-channel multispectral scanner. It had, it had two visible and two near-infrared channels. Its spatial resolution was about 80 by 60 square meters, with a swath of 185 by 195 square kilometers. Since then, up to now, seven other sensors were launched in order to guarantee the continuity of the mission. In 1971, the Landsat operation was transferred from NASA to NOAA, and each time new technologies providing more spectral bands and better spatial, spatial resolution have been employed. The last one is the Landsat 8, launched in February 2013. Landsat 8 provides, 8 provides, uh, provides free data of any part of the world in 11 bands with a spatial resolution varying from 15 up to 30 meters for the visible in infrared and uh, short, um, short wave infrared and uh, around 100 meters for long wave infrared uh, images. Here you can observe a table summarizing the spectral information of Landsat 8. There are four channels in the visible domain at a, spectral, uh, in, at a spatial resolution of 30 meters plus a panchromatic channel for pan sharpening at 15 meters. Then there are three bands in the short wave infrared and two bands acquired in the thermal infrared. Landsat is probably the most famous multispectral sensor in the remote sensing scientific community, being the reason the fact that it was the first one or that its data are freely distributed, Landsat mission is a reference for the remote sensing scientific community and its data are used all over the world. Yet it's important to say that there have been many other satellite missions during the last 30 years and at the moment there are a lot of multispectral sensors mounted on satellite platforms that acquire information about the Earth's surface. Some of them are public, operated by national and international space agencies. Other, others are private. A lot a lot of them provide mm, similar information, others acquire data at specific bands because they are focused on specific applications. From my point of view, it's not important to present more examples of sensors, 
But it's important from this point of view, Lanza, the experience is enough. It's more interesting to understand, even from a general point of view, how the sensor works. And finally, let's introduce the concept of hyperspectral uh, sensors. We have seen that multispectral imagers, such as the Landsat, measure reflectance of the Earth's surface at, at a few spectrally wide bands, separated by spectral segments where no, measuring, are, no measurements are taken. In other terms, multispectral sensors generally carry out a broadbanded discontinuous sampling of the electromagnetic radiation in the visible and infrared spectrum. When the sampling is not discontinuous but continuous and the sampling filters are not broadbanded but narrow banded, we obtain hyperspectral measurements. Hyperdata are usually 3D um, structure containing 2D spatial information and 1D um, frequency information concerning the spectral radiance of the observed scene. For these reasons, hyperspectral data are usually referred to as hypercube. When the spectrum of a single uh, pixel of, um, um, of an hypers uh, hyperspectral imagery is displayed, it appears much like a spectrum measured by um, a, metro a spectroscopy laboratory. And typically, they say that we need more than 30 contiguous bands to speak, ab uh, to speak about hyperdata. Yet it's important to say that is not the number of measured bands that, quali that qualifies a sensor as a hyperspectral, but rather the narrowness and contiguous nature of the measurements. This dense sampling provides enough details to distinguish between two similar covers that may appear much alike in spectral data. Let's analyze both multispectral and hyperspectral sensor from the technological point of view. A remote imaging system consists of six major subsystems. Airborne and spaceborne remote sensors are generally mounted on a moving platform. Therefore, it's necessary to properly point and stabilize their line of sight to form quality imagery. The term pointing refers to, mm, to moving the line of sight of the imaging system in a prescribed manner with respect to the scene so that it forms an image of the scene, while stabilization refers to compensating for moving platform disturbances such as vibration or attitude um, variations. The imaging optics captures the incident radiation and focuses it onto the focal plane detectors or FPA. Note that this implies a correspondence between the FPA image position and the incident field, uh, field, um, field angle or the object position. From a radiometric point of view, the, op the optics maps the incident radiation from a scene position into the focal plane irradiance at the corresponding focal plane position. The FPA consists of an array of detectors, each of which converts the incident irradiance into a detected electrical signal. The readout electronics multiplex analog signals from the array and performs the proper amplification, filtering and digitization to form a digital image. This is the so-called raw image, whose digital values are referred to as DNs, or which stands for digital numbers. To the conversion from the digital numbers to radiance or spectral radiance is carried out by the post-processing radiometric calibration step. So let's start with the pointing strategies. Current generation systems are either one-dimensional and two-dimensional detector arrays. When using 1D arrays, the line of sight must be scanned in at least one direction to form the image. A solution is the whisk broom acquisition, acquisition mode. In this scanning, the FPA is, is oriented in the along the track direction, and the scanning mirror scans across the platform path reflecting line into a single detector. This detector collects data of one special pixel at a time. Note that the moving part, the moving part of the of, of a whispering system makes this type of sensor expensive and more prone to wearing out. In push broom scanning, the, the linear FPA is oriented along the cross track direction and is pushed along the flight direction at a fixed cross-track angle as the platform moves forward. 
In this, in this mode, the, the linear FPA size directly defines the image width, which is called its worth in the image in the cross-track direction. It's worth point, pointing out that push boom scanners receive a stronger signal than whiz booms ones, as they look at each pixel of the area for longer. The main drawback is that the detectors usually show varying sensitivity, resulting in image stripping effects that must be properly calibrated. And finally, we have the digital frame cameras. The use of two-dimensional detectors makes it possible to capture a whole image without any line of sight scanning. When the platform is moving, the line of sight must be stabilized during the frame integration time to avoid image smearing. Usually, bands are acquired through independent optic hardware and later registered in a post-processing approach. This is the case of photogrammetric cameras such as the DMC, which are usually, usually employed for airborne data, data collection. This animation provides a very useful visual description of the three different acquisition modes that can be compared simultaneously. The whisk room in the left part of the slide, the push room in the middle, and the frame in the right part of the slide. It's important to stress that each type of system, each type of system has its advantages and drawbacks. Whisk rooms correspond probably to the oldest technology. Nowadays, multispectral sensors are more oriented to frame sensor when covering only the visible and the near infrared range. When uh, short, wave, short wave infrared or thermal infrared bands are to be acquired too, push boom design is generally preferred. But for hyperspectral sensors, push boom solution is always employed for reasons that will be clearer in next slide. Let's introduce the imaging optics. The imaging, the imaging optics captures the incident radiation and focuses it onto the focal plane detectors. Let's say that the, the ultimate purpose of an optical system is to produce an irradiance image of the, um, on the FPA that represents faithfully the radiance distribution of the scene. The basic parameters of an optical system are its focal length F and the, the aperture diameter D, which leads to the magnification factor M. M is equal to the ratio between the focal length and the target to sensor radial distance R. Another quantity of interest for definition of the spatial resolution of an optics is the so-called F number, which is equal to the ratio between the focal length and the aperture diameter. Defining with X, G, Y, G and R, G the coordinates of an object within the scene and with X and Y as the corresponding FPA coordinates, the radiance distribution F is ideally equal to the expression you can see on the right part of the slide. LPP is the real papillary plane radiation entering the sensor, K is a scale factor, and M is, as we have already just said, in the optics magnification. In practice, all optical systems are limited in their ability to produce the ideal geometric image F. According to the Fourier, Fourier optic analysis, the focal plane image for a linear shift invariant system is given by the 2D convolution of the real irradiance distribution and the system point spread function here represented with the, with the letter H, with the function H. Let's consider a very simple example. For a perfect circularly symmetric optical system, the point spread function is given by the Airy function. We can see the mathematical expression of the Airy function in the left part of the slide and a one-dimensional cut in the right part of the slide. A key parameter is the peak to null with epsilon zero, which describes the fundamental limit to image resolution. But besides the diffraction-based limit, there are other imperfections that affect the final image, such as geometrical aberration, distortion, and absorption. Ideally, the wave front from a point object converges to a perfect point of the focal plane as a result of a perfect optics. Distortion deforms this ideal wavefront and makes the rays converge at a different location on the focal plane, but does not impact the shape of the point spread function. On the contrary, aberrations broaden the response of a point object. The result is a blurring or loss of spatial resolution in the image. 
Finally, absorption, absorption decreases the transmission of radiance through the optical system to the FPA, reducing the image contrast relative to system noise level. The every function represents a simplified optics model, put here just to give you a feeling of the effect of diffraction onto the spatial resolution. A fuller understanding of, of, of optical system design and performance must include the characterization of potential geometrical aberration, which tends to broaden the PSF. A final type of aberrations I would like to mention here is the chromatic aberration. This is basically due to the dispersion of optical components. Nominally, the axial, the axial chromatic aberration are related to a change of the optical power with the wavelength, while the lateral, lateral chromatic aberrations correspond to changes in the magnification with wavelength. The dispersion of optical glasses is characterized by the so-called AB number, defined as a function of the refractive index at the center of the spectral range of interest and the change of the reflective index across this spectral range. So, low dispersion glasses with high AB number are called crown glasses. High dispersion glasses with low AB number are called flint glasses. In order to balance chromatic but also geometrical aberration, an efficient solution is represented by the so-called achromatic doublet. We present here the basic idea. Which is, implementing, which is implemented in many real optical systems. An achromatic doublet consists of a positive focal length chrome glasses and a negative focal length or diverging flint glass lens. The optic basics we have seen in the previous slides are independent of the spectral region where the sensor works. An important distinguishing characteristic among spectral regions is, however, the availability of high transmission materials that can be manufactured into smooth, precise surfaces that opti optical system systems require. As an example, in this slide you can observe typical spectral transmission for a variety of optical and, and infrared, uh, infrared materials. For visible imaging systems, borosilicate glass cutting off in the short wave infrared spectral region are often used. Fused silica provides high transmission values from visible up to short wave infrared wavelength. Silicon and sapphire provide good transmission across the medium infrared spectral region, but, but present a lower cutoff wavelength around one micron. And finally, the germanium, but also the zinc selenide or zinc sulfate, all provide good long wave infrared transmission. Okay, we have talked about pointing strategies, focusing principles. Let's now introduce another key block of multispectral hyperspectral sensor, the focal plane array or FPA. A focal plane array is a photodetector which consists of linear and two-dimensional matrices of individual photovoltaic detectors, usually photodiodes. Its job is basically converting irradiance distribution produced by an imaging optics into electrical signals. A great diversity of detectors have been developed for Earth observation, but there are two main drivers. First of all, achieving sensitivity in specific spectral regions and achieving sensitivity in small radiometric differences in the image. The first goal is usually accomplished selecting specific materials more sensitive to, spectral, to the spectral region to be studied. The second requirement is instead related to the specific design of the device. The FPA consists of two primary components, an array of detectors and a multiplexer. The first one produces an electrical response to incident radiation. This may be voltage, a current, an accumulated charge or a, resi or, or a resistance charge. The multiplexer is instead in charge of reading the information of each detector and transfer it to analog to digital, digital converters for the successive storage. For this reason, multiplexer are often referred to as readout integrated circuits. Generally, the switching circuits are either charge coupled device or CCDs or complementary oxide semiconductors or CMOS. Let's see the main difference between them. In a CCD sensor, the electrical charges stored at every pixel due to the incident radiation from the observed scene 
is transferred through a very limited number of output nodes, or very often just one, to be converted into an analog, analog signal. The CCDs read out photointegrated charges accumulated in each detector, which are called also well, through a sequence of capacitive gates along columns or rows depending on the FPA, FPA orientation. In this animation you can observe the phased operation for a single column. As the output, as the output bus presents only one download channel, the, the reading process is applied to one column at a time. First, the detectors or wells are filled by the incidence um, uh, radiation coming from the scene to be, made, to be imaged. Afterwards, the charge accumulating in the detector closer to the bus is read. Then, the second one passes its charge to the previous one, which has been previously empty, emptied, and freeing its space to accept the charge of the third detectors, and so on. What we are showing here is the basic idea of the reading process. Depending, depending on the integrated hardware, columns are read one at a time or all at once. In fact, there are many variations of this basic architecture, including those with multiple outputs to support higher image frame rates. Yet, the rationale of the CCDs is to transfer charge until it arrives to the bus that heats it to an analogical to digital converter. The CMOS readout is an alternative type of readout integrated circuit design. It uses switching circuits within each cell unit cell. The circuitry connects the unit cells directly to the output am amplifier. Such devices require more circuitry in the unit cell and for this reason the result can be noisier than the CCDs. Yet they offer greater f flexibility in image readout. In fact, the architecture allows access in each pixel of the matrix randomly, as you can observe here in the, the animation. In a CMOS sensor, each pixel has its own charge to voltage conversion. Moreover, the sensor often, often includes, includes amplifiers, noise correction, and digitization circuits, so that the chip output is already digital. Both CCD and CMOS imagers offer excellent imaging performance. CMOS imagers offer, offer more integration, which means more functions can be integrated on the chip, lower power, power dissipation, and the possibility of, of smaller system size. But today there is no clear line dividing the types of applications each mm, technology can serve. On the one hand, CMOS de designers have devoted intense e efforts to achieving high image quality. But on the other hand, CCD designers have lowered their power requirements and their pixel sizes. The difference in the reading readout strategy um, has significant implications for sensor, uh, sensor capabilities and limitation. I have listed here eight attributes which characterize image sensor pen performance, but I'd like just to mention those that I consider more important. First of all, the responsivity which is the amount of signal the sensor delivers per unit of input optical energy. And from this point of view, CMOS imagers are marginally superior than the CCDs. Dynamic, the dynamic range, which is the ratio of a pixel's saturation level to its signal threshold, and CCDs have the advantage here. Uniformity, which is the consistency of response for different pixels under identical illumination conditions. CMOS imagers Mm, were, traditional, were traditionally much worse than CCDs. However, new amplifiers have made the illuminated uniformity of some CMOS imagers close to that of CCDs. And finally, the windowing, because the CMOS technology has the ability to read out only a portion, if you want, of the image sensor, allowing elevated frame rates for small regions of interest. CCDs generally have limited abilities in windowing. There are two different types of detectors used in Earth observation, quantum detectors and thermal detectors. Without entering detail, quantum detectors are based on the photo-induced electronic events, that is, the incident photons produce electronic state change that turns into, that turn into observable electrical response. 
Thermal detectors, on the contrary, are, are based on radiative heating and their miserable characteristic is usually the temperature. In this tutorial, we will consider quantum detectors, basically photoconductors and photodiodes. A descriptor of the performance of a quantum detector is the quantum efficiency eta. This is dimensional, a dimensionless function representing the probability that, that an incident photon at a specific wavelength lambda will be absorbed um, in the detector and produce a corresponding photoelectron. The quantum efficiency is zero above the cutoff wavelength, whereas its value below it depends on the responsivity of the material. Another descriptor of the performance of the detector, which takes into account not just the crystalline properties of the detector material, but also the electronics, is the signal-to-noise ratio. This quantity corresponds to the ratio between the mean photoelectron level and the total system noise sigma n. The next slides detail the main contribution to sigma n. And the last description we can find when reading a detector datasheet is the noise equivalent, equivalent irradiance, also known as noise equivalent power. These two quantities basically indicate the difference in incident irradiation or radiative power required to produce a signal to noise ratio equal to one. The main assumption of these color descriptors is that spectral irradiance and the quantum efficiency are constant with wavelength. A variety of semiconductor materials has been developed for earth observation <coughs> detectors. Material type is extremely important because it determines the spectral region where the device can be optimally employed and the cutoff wavelength. Silicon, for example, is the st standard detector material in the visible and near infrared spectral region. Indium gallium arsenide detectors are used in the short wave infrared imaging application. In the picture in the left bottom part of the slide, you can observe how changing the composition of the indium and gallium alloy makes it possible to modify the cutoff frequency or cutoff wavelength. The indium antimoid is typically the detector material used in medium infrared region. The wavelet cutoff of mercuri mercurium cadmium telluride, also known as NCTE, can be tolerated between 0 0.83 microns up to 15 microns by adjusting the mercurium and cadmium composition and the element temperature. Therefore, application of this alloy encompasses Mm, short wave infrared, medium wave infrared, but also long wave infrared. Typical operating temperature are 180 Kelvin in the sphere, 100 Kelvin in the medium wave infrared, and 80 Kelvin, for example, in the long wave infrared, if we want a cutoff wavelength around 9 microns. But we have to go down uh, to 40 Kelvin for long wave infra infrared wavelength cutoff close to 12 microns. For this reason, from sphere to longer wavelength, detectors must be cooled to cryogenic temperature, with the additional benefit of reducing the dark current associated to any measurements. An analytical characterization of noise affecting quantum detector is not easy, but I think it's interesting at least to clear up the different nature of the main contributions to the system total noise. There are four statistically independent components which are indicated as the shot noise, dark noise, Johnson noise, and electronic noise. Briefly, the first one, the shot noise, is due to the inherent changes within the photodetectors that appears in case of constant illuminating radiation. The noise turns out to be Poisson distributed. The second one, the dark noise, is related to the statistical nature of discrete charge carries. The noise source is not related in this case to the illuminating radiation, but it's uh, Poisson distributed too. The Johnson noise is associated with carrier thermal motion in resistive circuit element. In this in case, it is characterized by this, this, this type of noise is characterized by normal distribution. And finally, the last term we, I indicated here with the substrate X indicates the noise associated to the readout circuitry to the preamplifiers and to the downstream electronics. The total noise estimation sigma n is given as the square root of the sum of each statistically independent term. 
this is the quantity that must be finally considered for the estimation of the, sigma, of the system signal to noise ratio. Oops, sorry. This collection of four images is a photo noise simulation. A source we use the sample image collected with a camera with a per pixel well capacity of about 40,000 40, photons. For our purpose, this camera can be assumed as a perfect camera, which means an array of detectors with quantum efficiency equal to one, no read noise, no thermal noise. Then what we did was add, we added a Poisson, a Poisson distributed noise. And going from left to right, we changed the mean number of photons per pixels, going from 1 to 10, 100 and 1000. Note, please note, the rapid increase in quality past the 10 photons per pixels. Photon noise is the dominant source of noise in the images that are collected by most digital cameras on the market today. Better cameras can go to lower levels of light. Specialized camera, very expensive, can detect even individual photons. But ultimately, photons show noise determines the quality of the image. This other image uh, gives um, you an example of the different noise patterns you can observe you have to deal with when readout electronic noise dominates the scene. This image corresponds to a night panchromatic image acquired with a um, DNC photogrammetric camera at a special resolution of 20 centimeters. Electronic noise is usually a structured noise, which means it presents periodicities. These periodicities can be stationary or non-stationary if the noise parameters vary across the image. But the latter case is um, the case of um, non-stationary periodicities are generated by intermittent interference between electronic components. In this case, you can observe four different periodic stationary patterns. If we carry our zoom, this is how this kind of this type of noise looks like. In order to filter this noise out, spectral analysis is usually performed. In the 2D color plot in the left part of the slide, you can observe the existence of regular spikes in the high frequency part of the image spectrum. So filtering these spikes in a proper way makes it possible to remove this, con this um, electronic noise contribution and to retrieve the background information. Of course, the result will be still affected by the Poisson distributed or Gaussian noise, um, national noise that can be reduced only using spatial filtering techniques. Okay, we have seen that the optics limit the spatial resolution of the imaging system, yet the radiation information focused by the optics is converted into a digital image by the FPA. What the FPA carries out is actually a sampling of the irradiance distribution. Assuming a perfect alignment between the optics and the FPA, a coarse estimation of the ground sampling distance can be calculated using the, the optics uh, focal length, the height of the sensor above the ground, in the physical dimension of each detector or the FPA in the direction under analysis. The optics magnification factor M is given by the ratio between the focal and the ground range distance. So the GSD is finally given by the dimension of the detector along the two orthogonal axes XY divided by the magnification factor M. This rough estimation is correct in case an alias free sampling is performed which means that the sampling carried out by the FPA is dense enough to preserve the optics spatial resolution. This condition is given by half the optical cutoff quantity, which is measured in cycles. This value can be approximated by the product between the wavelength to be sampled and the focal ratio, or the F number, of the optics. The vertical bars on the right side of the slide show what happens in case the alias free sampling condition is not fulfilled. Finally, it's important to stress that up to now, we have made no assumption about which is the property discriminating the radiation illuminating the FPA along the two axes. In case of frame cameras, remember the pointing strategies, the radiation being focused by the optics is only spatially characterized, meaning that along the X and Y axis, 
x and y axis of the FPA, we are receiving two-dimensional information of the same nature. For example, it can be a panchromatic image or, a two, uh, or an image corresponding, a bidimensional image corresponding to red radiation or blue radiation, green, even near, near infrared information. Multispectral and hyperspectral sensor based on push prune systems. No push prune system, which means acquiring just one line of the swath at, at a time, uh, use only one dimension of the FPA to store the spatial information, but the other dimension is instead used to separate the spectral information. The FPA is then a two dimensional device. But when we operate, when, when we use a multispectral or hyperspectral sensor, we end up with 3D data structure, where two dimensions contain information, um, spatial information of the image the surface, but the third dimension contains bands and contains spectral information we want to deal with. In order to produce dispersion and separate the frequency information contained within the radiation entering the sensor, two main technologies are available. Each of them is based on different physical principles. The first one is the refraction, which employs prisms, and the second one is diffraction, which uses gratings. In next slides, we are going to analyze both. Prisms are surely the oldest spectrometer component. They produce angular dispersion of light due to a combination of material dispersion and non-parallel optical surfaces. The amount of dispersion is limited by the material characteristics available and the optical aberrations introduced by the prism elements. The spectral dispersion performed by a prism is due to the change in refractivity index n of the prism material with wavelength. Since n decreases with wavelengths in regions of low absorption, short wave radiation is refracted at a greater deviation than, long, than longer wavelength. The sketch in the slide here describes the basic geometry of the refraction dispersion. Angles are described by Snell's law, which leads to define the ray angular deviation angles as a function of the incidence, incident angle and the refractive index. Being n a function of the wavelength in terms of the of material dispersion, the dependence of the ray angular deviation function with respect to the wavelength is related to the dependence of n with respect to lambda. The two images in the bottom part of the slide mm, describe the behavior of N for different materials used for prism generation in the spectral region of visible near-infrared and short-wave infrared on the left, and for medium-wave infrared and long-wave infrared on the right. An important parameter describing from a quantitative point of view the resulting power of mm, a dispersed material is the term R. This is defined as the ratio between the, the nominal wavelength lambda zero and the minimum resolvable wavelength differences delta lambda min. The last term depends on the spatial resolution of the optics and on the geometrical and physical properties of the prisms. In order to analyze the imaging process of a prism spectrometer, we must split the problem into two parts accounting for the spatial, spatial dimension and the spatial dimension. Let's analyze the spatial dimension first. Let the y direction describe the spectral domain and the x describe the spatial domain. The print spectrometer you can see in the lower part of the slide is a classical design. Basically, a first converging lens focuses the incoming radiation onto a slit which limits the sensor field of view. Afterwards, the beam starts diverging after the slit until it reaches a second rail relay lens, a collimator, which transforms the diverging beam into a parallel one. The collimated radiation passes through a flat side uh, sided prism placed into the collimated space and is finally focused onto the FPA. Note that the flat sided prism indicated that no refraction process is applied to the collimated beam. Spectrometer designs parameters such as the slit dimension, the dispersion of the optical axis, which is the center of the focal plane surface, and the optimum FPA width, which can be calculated using the formula on the, on the top right part of the slide. Oops. Let's analyze now the other dimension, the spectral one. 
The classical design has been maintained. It can be observed mm, as the prism now assumes the classical triangular shape. The spectral direction can be defined by three wavelength terms. The minimum wavelength lambda min, the maximum wavelength lambda max, and the central wavelength lambda zero. The interval between lambda min and lambda max is the spectrometer spectral range. This range bounds the spectral dimension of the, a detector array as it is described by the formula on the top right part of the slide. The central wavelength is the wavelength that strikes the center of the FPA at the optical axis. The mathematical relationships, the relationship that describes, um, described by the two formula, um, are key for the sensor design. In fact, given the spectral range and the FPA with two, um, the two equations, can be used to determine the um, focal, the optics, focal length f2 and the central wavelength lambda zero. Simple models admit analytical solution for this expression, but in real sensor design, the angular dispersion function phi is not linear, making the estimation of the design parameters quite complicated. But yet, we can say that the basic relationship ex expressed by the formula here in this slide keep holding. Transmission gratings are another common optical element used to produce dispersion in imaging spectrometers. Gratings are optical surfaces that contain a periodic structure with features in the order of the wavelength to be studied. Incident radiation is then diffracted into multi multiple uh, patterns, each of which is spectrally dispersed. By controlling the dimension and the shape of the periodic structure, one controls the amount of dispersion and the amount of energy diffracted into a specific order. Among the advantages of transmission gratings with respect to prints, there is the higher resolving, resolving powers in the infrared spectral range. But among the drawbacks, it's important to say that the higher internal scattering they present and the limitation due to the multiple order diffraction are, must be taken into account. This is explained basically by the sketch in the slide. The term M here indicates the order of the diffracted pattern. An incident ray travels through the transmission gratings, grating and exits without any angular change for M equal to zero with no spectral diffraction effect. Considering M equal to one, it is possible to calculate the output angle of a specific wavelength in the first order spectral diffraction pattern. With m equal to 1, the output direction, direction of the second order pattern, and so on. As for the prisms, it is possible to calculate a ray angular deviation formula and the analytical expression obtained with a linear approximation of the trigonometric functions. But it's important to stress that the angular dispersion, dispersion does not depend on the shape of the grating, but only on its period length. The shape of the grating will see that affects the energy distribution of the incoming radiation over the multi-order diffraction patterns. We are not going to enter in detail about the design of transmission grating shapes. I would like just to give here a few concepts about the theoretical formulation of the problem and what is the reality. The angular dispersion of transmission gratings is related to the grating period but the energy distribution is related to the grating shape, which is here represented by the function ty. It can be demonstrated that exists a relationship between the m coefficient of the Fourier transform of ty and the energy associated to the m diffraction pattern. From a theoretical point of view, amplitude gratings are not desired because they imply, they imply significant losses, losses in the incoming energy. Ideally, gratings introducing only a phase modulation of the traveling wave should be preferred. But if we now carry out an optimization of the problem in order to concentrate the energy in, 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 in a unique pattern, the result indicates that a blazed profile WI is the best phase grating. The energy in this case will be concentrated in the pattern corresponding to the order M equal to plus one. Unfortunately, the solution is just theoretical, because it's impossible to produce a blazed grating with wave-independent properties. Maximum efficiency is obtained is equal to 1, but just for a specific central wavelength, 
while diffraction efficiency decreases significantly across the full spectral range. An alternative approach is to produce a phase grating with a periodic refractive index profile, but again, the inherent wavelength dependence makes this solution not ideal. Taking into account all these features, transmission gratings are used only sometimes for imaging spectrometers, and a more common solution is the, the, the employment of reflection gratings. The basic idea is to make incoming energy illuminate a periodic structure and to obtain the spectral dispersion via reflection and not diffraction. The primary advantage with respect to the transmission gratings is that the metallic materials, metallic materials provide lower losses across broad spectral ranges, and besides the quality of the manufacturing is nowadays very high thanks to precision diamond turning and the combination of electron beam lithography and etching processes. The sketch in, the, in this slide traces the basic idea behind the reflection gratings. The reflection mechanism over a periodic structure introduce, mm, introduces an optical uh, path difference, or OPD, between points belonging to the same uh, wavefront. Therefore, the corresponding phase grating function will be given by the ratio between this path difference and the specific wavelength considered for the study. The condition for a unity diffraction efficiency corresponding to the first order spectral pattern is given by the third formula on the right part of the slide. Also for the reflection gratings, the maximum efficiency is achieved only for a central wavelength, but its lower decreases across the, the spectral range and the lower energy loss with respect to transmission gratings make their use more appealing. If we consider a traditional design for transmission or reflect reflection gratings as the one already analyzed for Prince spectrometer, we can see that they, they work almost the same way. For example, the basic design equation defining the relationship between the FBI, FBA um, dimension in space, optics magnification factor and field of view is exactly the same. Yet, there is a main change in the spectral dimension related to the slightly different angular dispersion relationships. For transmission or reflecting gratings, the spectral dispersion takes place in, in the opt opposite direction so that the sign of the two terms representing the input to the tangent function changes. Concerning the phi lambda expression, the general formulation is the same, but the approximation for linear dispersion is now different. You can observe the new equation for linear dispersion in the bottom part of the slide. For design purposes, this approximation, the linear one, is very useful. If we indicate with delta phi the desired angular dispersion across the full spectral range between lambda min and lambda max to match the FPA with WI, being fixed the focal length F2, the linear dispersion approximation can be used to find the optimum grating period, which is indicated here by the capital lambda, and the wavelength value at the optical axis we have indicated here with lambda zero. We have pointed out at least a couple of times that an important property of transmission as well as reflection gratings is the multi-order diffraction. These multi-order patterns do not, do not appear in Prince-based spectrometer. The grating non-overlapping condition, condition, or NOC, basically defines the maximum spectral range in order to avoid overlapping of different ordered diffraction patterns. The image in the left part of the slides traces this issue. In order to widen the spectral range that can be covered by a diffractive grating spectrometer, a typical solution is the use of specific band filters. For example, let's consider the case of a visible near-infrared spectrometer. In order to avoid the overlapping of a short wavelength of the second-order pattern between 0.4 and 0.55 microns, and the long wave and the long wavelength of the first-order pattern from 0.9 to 1.1 microns, it can be used as so-called order filtering filter. This filter is basically a high-pass filter with a cutoff wavelength close to 0.7 microns. When using order filtering solution, the key design, <clears throat> the key design parameter is the filtering tolerance. The reason is that mm, it's important to assume that there will be an 
alignment error between the filter transmission region and the FPA. This means that if from a theoretical point of view this concept can be extended to cover larger spectral range, using more filters implies more constraining tolerance. So in this case the best solution to achieve our goal, which is to widen the spectral, uh, the spectral range, is to use another solution, which is the so-called dichroic filtering. A dichroic, you can observe this on the right part of the slide. A dichroic filter is basically a component um, which is completely transparent for a specific spectral range, but it behaves like a mirror for others. This means that it's possible to use a single spectrometer for the entire spectral range, but we can separate the visible near infrared and the short wave infrared information, which will be focused on different FPA located in two different positions. Obviously, this idea can be extended to cover more spectral regions. This is the rationale, for example, of the ESA, of the Electro um, European Space Agency ECO telescope, whose design you can observe on the right part of the slide. The optics incorporates five dichroics, dichroics uh, for spectral division. The first dichroic, uh, D1, directs short wave light towards the fine guidance sensor, the FGS, which is used for high precision pointing information, and the visible and near infrared channel. Further dichroics divide the remaining light through, the, through for example, the grating based dispersive spectrometer of the short wave infrared module or the prism-based dispersive spectrometer of the mid-wave infrared module and the prism-based dispersive spectrometer for the long-wave infrared module. So at this point we can say that the spectral and spatial radiation illuminates properly the FPA, but a few words must be devoted now to the description of the main distortion characterized the sampling step carried out by the FPA, the smile or smiling and the keystone. The linear dispersion approximation is extremely useful to define the initial layout of the spectrometer, but in order to take into account non-linear dispersion and optics dispersion, a more precise mapping is required. We have seen that there are equations to characterize the angular dispersion of prints or, uh, or uh, gratings. Let's indicate with row the spectral direction of the FPA and with column the spatial direction. From a theoretical point of view, a column should represent the spectral information for the same pixel of the slit. And this is the green uh, vertical line in the left grid on the, of the slide. <clears throat> Similarly, a row should describe the information, um, the information at a specific wavelength of the whole uh, field of view. Always theoretically, um, always um, theoretically, it is possible to define an analytical relationship between the angular dispersion of the spectrometer and the row index of the FPA. You can observe it in the top part of the slide. Remember that PY is the detector spacing along the Y direction while K0 corresponds to the row index at the opti optical axis. The term int is the nearest internal rounding function. Unfortunately, a real imaging system presents nonlinear mapping and there can be both spatial and spectral distortions. Conventional imaging system presents a so-called pincushion effect and as it, this is described um, by the sketch on the right part of, the, of this slide. The distorted rows represent the slit mapping for a single spectral band. The distorted columns, the mapping of the spectrum for a single position of the slit. Then, the spatial spectral distortion is essentially a mapping of each row column coordinate of the APA of the FPA in terms of lambda and in terms of position of the, slide, of the slit. In other term, the band center may, no, may now vary across the row and the slit position may now vary along, across the column. So the smile accounts for the distortion along the spectral dimension and is defined as the maximum deviation of a slit image for a single wavelength from linear relative to the detector width. The keystone accounts for the distortion along the spatial dimension. 
and is defined as the maximum deviation for a slit for a slit for a point of the slit across the spectral range from the UNR relative to the detector width. In order to carry out the FPA spectral calibration and in order to characterize the smiling, in lab measurements are required. Depending on the spectral region of the sensor, the radiation sources may differ, yet the approach is exactly the same. In general, spectral calibration refers to the estimation of spectral band center for all the samples of hyperspectral data, uh, data cube. For imaging spectrometers, it involves the estimation of the center wavelength of each detector of the FPA. So the main idea is to measure the response of the imaging system for, n, for a number n of spectral narrowband input signals in the visible and near infrared as well as in the short wave infrared regions. This is um, achievable using a monochromator, which is a device with, um, that can, can sweep across an entire spectral range. Or you can use also specific lasers or lamps whose emission peaks are well known. Um, on the contrary, in the long wave infrared, you can, there, are, there are still lasers you can use or plastic, plastic diffusers to filter radiation from calibrators from black bodies. For each measurement at a specific wavelength lambda n, we will have a set of m points of the FPA with non-null response, that is the m coordinates I, mm, ik. It is possible then to approximate the total spatial spectral distortion as a quadratic function taking into account the smile effect, the misalignment between optics, be between optics and FPA, and the nonlinear dispersion. Then all the measurements are arranged um, in a linear equation system that can be solved with a minimum least square technique. The difference between the linear estimation of the center uh, wavelength and the real one at pixel level gives directly the smiling. In order to obtain a uniform spatial and spectral distribution, we finally carry out a bidimensional interpolation from the non-regular grid to onto a regular grid. The last calibration step we are going to analyze in this tutorial is the radiometric calibration. The aim of the radiometric calibration is to estimate the spectral radiance corresponding to the measure of each element of the FPA. In other terms, it aims at correcting all the non-uniformities present, present in the FPA response when the input radiation is assume, assumed to be uniform. This idea applies to frame sensors as well as to push pull multispectral and hyperspectral devices. So the first step is to define a reliable calibrator. Depending on the spectral regions, uh, different calibrators must be employed. For this reason, we separate now the thermal spectral regions from the visible near and sphere region. Mm. In this part, we analyze, in this slide, we analyze the visible near and sphere regions. So the calibrator used in this case is called integrating sphere. Each sphere is calibrating according to the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And it, it basically consists or consists of a sphere coated with a reflective diffusely scattering material. The sphere has two holes, one for the illuminating source and the other one for the output. The high reflection, the high number of reflections inside the sphere guarantees the uniformity of the output light, which is required for the correction of non-uniformity of the sensor field of view. Now, the response of the, of the integrating sphere is known in terms of spectral radiance. You can observe the in-lab measurement of the integrated sphere used at the Cartographic and Geological Institute of Catalonia to assess the radiometric calibration of the CASI sensor, which is an hyperspectral visible near instrument regularly uh, flown by the Institute. Normally, for the calibration, we apply a linear model. So the main hypothesis is that the response of the sensor to be calibrated is linear within a specific range of the ends. The linearity is usually checked by the manufacturer by the construction of the so-called light transfer curve. 
We have said that the mm, photo-induced electronic events are distributed according to a Poisson uh, distribution. This means that the ratio between the variance and the mean value of the dn measured by the FPA must be linearly distribute, distributed. You can observe here an example of the light transfer curve calculated for the hyperspectral thermal infrared uh, sensor TASI, operated, also operated by the ICGC. So afterward, a linear model is applied to each detector of the FPA. Basically, the measurements uh, correspond to the real incoming energy multiplied by a gain factor plus a noise level caused by the dark currents. Mm, the incoming energy can be, can be factorized as the power generated at a specific wavelength by the integrated sphere multiplied by the integration time settings of the instrument to be calibrated. So, summarizing, there are three main steps for the radiometric calibration here. First of all, the estimation of the dark current, which is the, the level, defined level of noise in characterizing our acquisition. The energy to power conversion to be able to compare the, to compare the um, theoretical values uh, of the integrating sphere to the, to the values at the end actually um, measured by, the, by our sensor and estimation of the gain value of each detector of the FPA. And finally, I'd like to say also that um, we, both use, we, we use both near and far field acquisi acquisitions, um, a combination of, um, of these two acquisitions in order to achieve both a um, uniformity of the field of view, but also a high radiometric precision in our calibration. And finally, just a few words about the radiometric calibration of, of thermal infrared sensors. Actually, this, mm, <clears throat> this task in, turns out to be more complicated than the in visible and near infrared um, devices. The calibrator, first of all, we will say that the first, the first step is to define a calibrator we can use for this purpose. So the calibrator used is the black body. A black body is a calibrator be, um, is a device um, based on thermoelectric heating cooling mechanisms whose emissivity is known. Theoretically, its emissivity should be one over the whole thermal infrared region, but real calibrators, above all, when they provide a large flight area for calibration, um, can be characterized by an emissivity around 0 0.9798 and besides, the value, the value of emissivity may present fluctuations over the thermal infrared spectral region. For this reason, being very tight about certification accuracy is crucial in order to obtain a robust radiometric calibration for a thermal infrared um, instrument. Um, I have already said that with respect to the integrated sphere, this calibra the calibration process here is more difficult. Um, the reason is that um, carrying out the carrying out the integrating integrating sphere measurement in a dark room where the only light source is the calibrator is a um, is a sufficient to exclude any other light generation process. But in case of thermal radiation, there are a lot of um, other contributions we have to take into account. First of all, there are internal contributions. I'm referring now to the sensor enclosure and to device substrate. As they have a temperature higher than zero Kelvin, they emit thermal radiation, which illuminate the FPA. Besides, there is the surrounding environment that must be taken into account too. In fact, if the emissivity of the black, of the black body used um, for the calibration is not exactly one, independently of how close to the sensor the calibrator is placed in order to cover the whole field of view, there will be always additional contributions of the environment radiation. This radiation, in fact, is, a reflect on the, is reflected on the surface of the calibration and enters the sensor. And this radiation, this environmental radiation which enters the sensors, is modulated by a factor, by a factor equal to 1 minus the emissivity, the own emissivity of the black body. Mm, I, uh, I don't want to enter in detail, 
But um, what I like to say here is um, that it's not possible to um, to estimate directly the internal uh, con internal contribution of the device, but we can eliminate them using a differential approach. Approach. The solution is the measurement um, the measurement using two calibrators at different temperatures, um, keeping the sensor at constant thermodynamic condition. In this case, by acquiring data of the two black bodies at different temperatures, it is possible to build up a linear equation system, and its solution is directly provides directly, the, in the minimum square sense, the um, calibration coefficient of each detector of the FPA. Okay, this is the last part of this tutorial, which deals with a brief overview of the sensors that are nowadays available for remote sensing applications. First of all, we will see the satellite multispectral and hyperspectral sensors. Among the multispectral sensors, there are high resolution satellite systems providing images at spatial resolution varying from 30 centimeters up to 1.5 meters. Normally, these sensors are focused on cartographic applications, and for this reason, they usually acquire data in in the four broadband channels, the red channels, the green channel, the blue band and the near infrared used for cartographic application. Besides, they acquire at very high um, spatial resolution also the panchromatic information in order to enhance the spatial resolution of multispectral images using pan sharpening techniques. It is worth mentioning here the worldwide uh, Worldview 2 satellite, which acquires panchromatic images plus eight spectral bands the four standard colors and the four new colors, the red edge, coastal, the yellow, and an additional infrared channels. The satellite sensor is able to take a new acquisition of any place of the Earth every 1.1 days. Here you can find some, some examples of satellites that provide multispectral images at moderate spatial resolution ranging from a few meters up to 30 meters in the visible near and sphere spectral regions and in the order or in the order of 100 meters for long wave infrared domain for example there is the japanese alos the now german rapid ai the american uh, landsat the french spot etc as you can see there is a wide set of multispectral satellite sensors available at the moment so the selection of a specific sensor on another should be driven by several factors. For example, the availability of a historical collection of data over an area of interest, the spatial resolution, the spectral information they provide, and last but not least, the price. In fact, some sensors belong to national agencies and data and the data distribution is free, but others belong to private companies and you must, must pay for them. In this table, I have summed up the, um, some features of, um, of uh, spaceborne sensors, such as um, the spatial resolution, the swath, the number of spectral bands they acquire. Another important piece of information is knowing if they can perform periodic acquisitions um, on specific area of interest. Finally, I would like to highlight here probably the most important spaceborne sensor providing daily hyperspectral information at global scale. It's the NASA MODIS. MODIS stands for Moderate uh, Resolution Imaging Spectral Radiometer. It's a key instrument aboard, uh, aboard the Terra satellite launched in 1999 and Aqua satellite launched in 2002. MODIS acquires information of the Earth's surface in 36 spectral bands spreading from visible to thermal infrared. Its revisit time is between one day and two days depending on the latitude of the area to be studied. And it's important, very important, to mention it because MODIS plays a vital role in the development of models for global change prediction and environment, environment protection. A few words about the airborne hyperspectral, hyperspectral sensor area. Concerning the airborne hyperspectral sensor, it takes too long to present a whole collection of the sensor available at the moment. I have prepared here a table with, I guess, most, but probably not all, of them. There are a lot manufactured by both public and private companies, operated by public and private companies. Most of them 
cover only a specific spectral region visible in near infrared or short wave infrared or medium infrared or long wave or thermal infrared yet there are a few now nowadays covering both uh, vis uh, visible near infrared and mm, short wave infrared the number of bands varies a lot too more airborne instruments here and these are the last ones if you want to carry out a study based on hyperspectral imagery, what I recommend is to define the part of the spectrum to be analyzed over a specific area. Then to carry out a selection, a selection of the sensors covering it. And finally to check if, mm, if mm, there are free data sample available and if it is possible to buy, to buy new data or schedule new acquisition. And we have arrived now to the very last slides of this tutorial. A quick look to the future. Looking to the future, I'd like to mention the new Worldview satellite mission, the Worldview 3, to the eight multispectral bands of Worldview 2 at 30 centimeter spatial resolution. Digital Globe has added eight um, short wave infrared bands at 3.7 meters, plus 12 new channels called Kevis bands. These new bands are devoted to specific ap applications. According to Digital Globe, these advanced features are likely to help in mapping, land classification, in disaster change detection, soil and vegetation analysis, mining, environmental monitoring, bathymetry, coastal applications, and a lot of this satellite is expected to launch mid-August this year in 2014. The Copernicus Sentinel-2 Earth Observation Mission, developed by the European Space Agency, will provide continuity to services relying on multispectral high-resolution optical observations over global terrestrial surfaces. The Sentinel-2 mission will offer multispectral data with 13 bands in the visible near infrared and short wave infrared part of the spectrum. Their visit time will be about five days at the equator under the same viewing condition. The spatial resolution varies from 10 meters for the visible infrared to 20 meters and 60 meters in the sphere region. Frequent revisits and high mission availability will require two identical Sentinel-2 satellites operating simultaneously. The Sun Synchronous Orbit has been selected to guarantee a local time around half past 10 a.m. This local time was selected as the best compromise between minimizes, minimizing cloud cover and ensuring a suitable sun illumination. Besides, it's, it's close to the Landsat local time and matched perfectly the spots, allowing the seamless uh, combination of Sentinel-2 data with historical images to build long-term long time series. The launch of the first satellite is expected in 2015. And finally, concerning the, um, the, future, uh, the future of satellite hyperspectral remote sensing, there are four future missions on, on the horizon. The Japanese Shui, the American Spiri, the Italian Prisma and the German Airmap. Most of them were initially scheduled to be launched um, between um, 2012 and 2013. But all were postponed for different reasons. You can see in the slide the new launch dates each uh, space agency expects. We will see if these dates are confirmed. You can see also that as the interest of all the mission is focused on the same region of the electromagnetic spectrum, the visible near infrared and the short wave in infrared. None of them acquired data in the medium or thermal instrument. Okay, that concludes this tutorial. I hope it has been useful to understand the basic of multispectral and hyperspectral remote sensing. Thank you very much for your attention. Have a nice day. Bye.